Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, I, my name is Azar Bistavros. I am the Associate Provost for Computing and Data Sciences. And it, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all um, to the Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences inaugural event on the subject of learning to think after chat GTP, GPT. Let me start by saying that it is really proper that the inaugural event is on a topic that speaks to the vision and mission of CDS. So let me tell you that our mission statement starts with, we conduct cutting edge research that matters to society, and it ends with our goal of unleashing the transformative power of computing and data. So today's discussion on ChatGPT speaks to the extent to which computing and data science research impact society by looking at one of the most important factors shaping our society, and indeed our humanity, which is education and how we learn. For decades now, teaching has been largely immune from the disruptive effects of um, computing technologies. Every other profession got transformed, dis disrupted, except for the teaching profession to, to a large extent. Well, the chat GPT conversation is, is gaining momentum in higher education precisely because it directly disrupts teaching, learning, and pedagogy, prompting us as educators to think how we teach. And chat GPT is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to how the broader generative AI technology will impact our ways of thinking and doing. How do we, as educators, respond to the large language model? And how are we going to, quote unquote, up our game in response to the increased use of these tools? Today's panel will discuss these and other questions, a discussion that I'm really looking forward to having. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce today's moderator, Professor Mark Rovella. Mark is the CDS Chair of Academic Affairs, overseeing the development and rollout of CDS's academic programs and curricula. Uh, he, a professor in both computer science and computing and data sciences. Uh, Mark's research is focused on data science methods with application to biological and social science problems. But before I leave um, the stage, um, and on your behalf, I wanted to say thank you in advance to our distinguished panelists, Najoon Kim and Wesley Wildman, and to the entire CDS team who worked so hard to put this event together, and especially to our Director of Communication, uh, Maureen McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Maureen. Thank you, everyone. And now, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Azar. Uh, and welcome, everyone. I'm really pleased to be discussing uh, ChatGPT with you today uh, and to be moderating this panel. Uh, so let me start with a little bit of a story. So yesterday was a busy day for me. And I was kind of short on time. And I knew that I needed to uh, prepare some thoughts about uh, the cheap, uh, panel on GPT. So what did I do? Uh, you can imagine what I did. I opened ChatGPT. I asked it, please write an introduction for a panel discussion on ChatGPT. And it responded, welcome everyone to this panel discussion on ChatGPT, a cutting edge language model that has revolutionized the way we think, I'm sorry, the way we interact with artificial intelligence. ChatGPT is an advanced artificial intelligence language model developed by OpenAI, capable of generating human-like responses to a wide range of questions and prompts. The ChatGPT model is trained on an enormous corpus of human language data, allowing it to understand and respond to a vast array of topics and questions. This technology has far-reaching implications for industries such as customer service, education, and research. ChatGPT has already demonstrated its ability to provide personalized, intelligent responses that are indistinguishable from those of a human 
thereby offering a more engaging and efficient way for people to interact with technology. <coughs> so, some observations here. Uh, first of all, this is actually a pretty good introduction to our panel. So there, I'm done. <laughs> but more broadly, this really exemplifies why we're here today. It begs the question, how should we think about intellectual work in the academy when our software tools can produce such a remarkable artifact, one that seemingly produces human-level output from practically zero effort? OK, well, here's another example. Next thing I did was I typed in, please rewrite that in the form of a poem. And ChatGPT did. It said, ChatGPT, a marvel of tech, a language model so complex, trained on vast swaths of language data, capable of answering any beta. Its skills in conversation so refined, a human touch it can easily find, engaging and natural its responses be, able to converse as we do with glee, revolutionary in nature it be, industries it can change without a fee. From education to research and service, the impact on all will be truly massive. So this is amusing, uh, not only because ChatGPT seems to write poetry in the style of Yoda from Star Wars, uh, but uh, once again, it gives us something to think about here. Um, consider these last two lines, from education to research and service. Its impact on all will be truly massive. Indeed, ChatGPT has really summarized the challenge for us, research, teaching, and service. And just in case it's not clear, ChatGPT seems unstoppable. It launched on November 30th of last year, and just two months later, Reuters reported that it reached 100 million monthly users, making it the fastest growing consumer application in history according to a UBS investment bank research note. By comparison, TikTok took nine months to reach 100 million users, and Instagram took two and a half years. ChatGPT has obviously shaken up the technology industry, prompting a $10 billion investment from Microsoft and causing Google to quickly roll out its own competitor. So that's why we're here today, to ask two questions. First of all, what is ChatGPT? And secondly, how should we approach research, teaching, and service in a world that includes tools like ChatGPT? To that end, we have a distinguished panel to guide us. First, we have uh, Najun Kim, Professor Najun Kim. Uh, Dr. Kim's an assistant professor in the Department of Linguistics and an affiliated faculty at the Department of Computer Science in Boston University. Dr. Kim is also a visiting faculty researcher at Google. Before joining BU, she was a faculty fellow at the Center for Data Science at New York University and received her PhD in Cognitive Science from Johns Hopkins University. She's interested in studying meaning in both human and machine learners, and especially ways in which they generalize to novel inputs and ways in which they treat implicit meaning. Next, we have Professor Wesley Wildman. Dr. Wildman is a professor of philosophy, theology, and ethics in the School of Theology here at BU. He also holds appointment in the Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences, where he serves as Chair of Faculty Affairs. His primary research and teaching interests are in philosophical theology, philosophy of religion, philosophical ethics, religion and science, the scientific study of religion, computational humanities, computational social sciences, and the ethics of emerging technologies. Within CDS, Dr. Wildman teaches data, society, and ethics, a course that develops students' ability to critically examine and question the interplay between data science and computational technologies on the one hand, and science and public policy on the other. So these are our panelists. The format of our panel will be as follows. Each of the panelists will speak for 15 to 20 minutes. After that, we'll use the remaining time for questions from the audience. There will be microphones available. So you can just raise your hand, and one will be brought to you to ask questions at the end. So with that, I'd like to turn the program over 
to uh, Professor Najung Kim. Here you go. Yeah, thanks so much for the intro, and um, I'll get started into the presentation right away, if it's, if it's working. Um, yeah, so today my role is to talk about what is ChatGPT, and I guess basically to give you an accessible overview of the technologies behind um, building this model. So there are three main ingredients of ChatGPT, the first of um, which is a pre-trained language model, and also some supervision with, uh, for supervised fine tuning on demonstrations and reinforcement learning from human feedback. So these are kind of like technical words. So my, my goal here is to kind of give you an overview of what these components actually mean. I'll start with the question of what is a language model? So in NLP traditionally, language modeling used to mean something like assigning probabilities to utterances in a sentence, uh, utterances in language. So if I say like language model used to mean this, like what is the probability of that being uttered? Um, so it was a modeling of probability distribution over utterances. But now um, it kind of acquired a meaning referring to something like token prediction and context. And what does that mean? So if I give you this kind of a context, the cat sat on the, or like prefix or a prompt, um, and ask you to complete this, um, what would come to your mind first? And if you kind of share the same prior as me about English, maybe like the word mat comes to mind. Um, but the cats can sit on other things like couch, floor, table, human, etc. And this is the task of like token or like word prediction and context because you're given a context to predict something from. And a language model is a model that is trained to do this kind of context completion. And it, is, it doesn't have to be a neural network, but it is, um, in ChatGPT, a large neural network model that learns um, and adjusts its parameters based on um, training on these tasks. So it is a special flavor of a language model called autoregressive language model. And what does that mean? So if you have a context completion task, um, given this um, context of the cat sat on the, the model might have some distribution over possible completions like this and decides to choose the first one met. Then what happens is to produce like longer sequences than just like a single token, um, you get the word met and then append it to the existing context in the previous step and pass that as the input to the model. So um, now the prediction met from the model is used as part of the input that it generates um, its next token from. And it can be something like, you know, you can decide to end the sentence or continue with other completions. So we've briefly looked at um, what is a language model and now I'm gonna tell you about like the pre-trained part. So um, language model is a model trained to predict tokens in context. And the pre-trained part means it was trained on this objective prior to being used for other purposes. So you have a model, and before it is like deployed and used, like for instance, like ChatGPT as a chatbot, um, it is trained on millions and billions of um, language data. And before um, going into this further, I just wanted to mention like why context completion is chosen as kind of an objective of um, training these models. So this example, is kind of a nice illustrative example, but it doesn't feel very useful. Um, but if you think of other useful downstream tasks that um, different models can perform in natural language processing, you can think of formulating um, useful tasks like translation into context completion. So for instance, instead of the cat sat on the, if I gave the model translate, the cat sat on the mat into Korean and ask it to complete the context, then it is a context completion task that does translation. And it can do other things like question answering, who's giving a talk at VUCDS today, or something more complicated like travel planning. So I live in Boston, I wanna to fly to Seattle in May, but have to visit these cities on the way, what's the best itinerary, context completion. And um, one cool thing is it doesn't have to be restricted to human language. So um, one kind of cool um, property of ChatGPT like models, it's, it's able to do code completion as well. So I don't know if you can read the um, 
text here, but basically it's given a definition and a description in natural language what the code does, and it will actually write the code for you or like complete the given context um, with code that actually like works for, um, that performs this kind of a function. So that was um, why context completion is useful as an objective to train models on. And I wanna talk about like, so what is the, what is the kind of the constitution of the base language model of ChatGPT? So the quick answer is like, we don't know for sure. Um, but from just kind of gathering from the publicly available information from OpenAI, it is a model, um, ChatGPT is a fine-tuned model from the GPT 3.5 series. And GPT 3.5 series is a series of models that was trained on a blend of text and code um, from before Q4 2021. So you have a model, um, presumably it's a large language model, meaning it has a lot of parameters that you can tune. Um, so GPT-3, which is a precursor of GPT-3.5, had 175 billion parameters. So if I had to guess, um, it would be a model of a comparable size or even larger. And presumably it's trained on a lot of web text or books, Wikipedia, or, and given its performance on like code completion, probably also like publicly licensed GitHub code. So I wanna mention that this is an educated guess, but not confirmed, obviously. But I believe this is in the kind of the ballpark of the composition of the language model that is underlying ChatGPT. So we've looked at the first part, the pre-trained language model. Um, but given my kind of like discussion about how context completion is such a useful objective and language models do these kind of things, like why do we even need these extra things on top? So I hope um, it, I conveyed to you enough that like, you know, context completion, if it works well, it can be used to perform various different tasks. But um, empirically, it has been found that language modeling alone often produces undesirable behavior when it's asked to do context completion. So one example that illustrates well is this example. So a human prompted the model with explain the moon landing to a six-year-old in a few sentences. And GPT-3, which was just like a pure language model, um, gave this completion, which is, I guess, the most likely prediction or completion given its training data, but it doesn't really align or match the user intent of like asking this um, question to a model, right? So that's why um, things like supervised fine tuning and the RLHF I'll get to a little later is used to kind of align these models to like better to human intent. So I'll give a brief overview of how that works. So you first sample a prompt or a query or a question, whatever you query the model with, and you actually get a human annotator to demonstrate some desirable behavior given this query. And then you collect multiple examples of these and tune the base language model on this input output pair so um, it can try to produce like um, outputs that aligns with what a human thought was a desirable behavior. So that was the supervised fine tuning part. And reinforcement learning from human feedback uses this model to um, tune the model further. So the first step is, again, sample a prompt, and now you have a model that was tuned on desirable behaviors, right? And then this model um, can produce responses to this kind of a question, and then you sample multiple um, versions of the model responses, and then collect human annotator preferences or rankings um, that rank this data. So if you had like four different examples, A, B, C, D, you kind of get a human preference ranking over those. And then um, a reward model is trained, which means that this is a model that produces a real numbered score given a certain response to a prompt. And the, um, the value of this um, model output should um, reflect the rankings that are human preferences. So the reward model um, tries to give a higher score or a higher reward to a response that was ranked higher by the model. And then um, now you do this again, like sample a new prompt, and the model um, that was initialized from the supervised um, fine-tuned version generates a response. And then now because we have the reward model that was trained on human preference, now we can get some number 
that reflects the reward value attached to that model uh, response given that particular prompt. So the reward model calculates the reward, and this can now then be used as signal for the reinforcement learning algorithm that further updates the model. So that is the idea of how these things are trained to uh, like better reflect human preferences for responses. And the outcome, it actually works pretty well. So compared to the GPT-3 response, Instruct GPT, which was also a precursor of the chat GPT, which was trained in a similar way that I described, um, gives a much better response, like people went to the moon and they took pictures of what they saw, blah, blah. And it looks like chat GPT has been trained, like uh, has gone through like more refined training. The answer seems um, even better than the previous Instruct GPT response. So that was a quick walkthrough of the three ingredients of ChatGPT. And I want to use like maybe two minutes to um, talk about like what is coming next. And I want to mention that um, these are not new ideas that they came that I came up with. These like exist in the research literature. And um, I'm hoping that these will be like reflected in the next generation of the models. So one thing that you might expect to see in the next generation of models is models that can access external tools. So um, models like Lambda and Toolformer are able to actually have um, execute or like have queries, predict queries that actually calls some external tools like a calculator or a translator or a Google search. And similarly, um, this new paper from Schick et al. Um, 2023 proposes Toolformer that predicts kind of this like special queries that correspond to like tool access. So, um, you know, the one of the weaknesses of language models was like, you know, numerical computation is hard, arithmetic, these things, and this, they can leverage tools in order to improve upon that aspect. And I would expect like integration of real-time information and attribution to sources to improve in the next generation of models. So in courtesy of Kyung Hyun Cho at NYU, he um, observed that I only wrote my blog post three days ago and the answer, um, the blog post was, uh, Bing Chat was able to incorporate the blog post into its response and also give credit for that. So we're already seeing glimpses of this ability in um, next generation of models. And finally, I'm um, excited about multimodality. So models like Flamingo and Fromage are able to incorporate kind of like image responses um, and image, um, parse image inputs in their conversation. So that's another kind of aspect that we might see in the next generation of models. So final slide, remaining issues. Um, hallucination and factuality is a big issue. These models are known to kind of make up things a lot. And it also has limited context window. Um, it doesn't, I think ChatGPT has 8,000 tokens um, as its maximum context window, so things would like not be incorporated into the conversational context beyond that. And again, data efficiency, this is trained on like trillions of millions of tokens. Um, and it, I'm not sure if this will actually be like prioritized by like industry development settings. Um, if they already have the infrastructure to do all of these training. Um, and like this kind of like large scale training works well. So I'm not sure like whether this would be like in the higher priorities of like the next steps. But if you think of kind of generalizing to multimodal, uh, multilingual settings, um, English is a very high resource language, but um, even like me medium resource language like, like Korean, um, I personally feel as a native speaker, it's not quite there. It's not as good as like the English responses. So um, maybe data efficiency is crucial if you want the models to generalize to like much lower resource languages. And there's an issue of fairness and bias that has been <laughs> that has been um, getting um, has been known to get worse with like like scaling of the models. So like larger models tend to display like more biased against like marginalized social groups. So this is also an issue that the language models need to deal with. And as personally, um, as a researcher, I find, find this trend of like models behind APIs without like open access a little challenging um, because it makes systematic evaluation difficult. So it would be nice to have some more transparency and the ability to like conduct more scientific experiments with these models. But in any case, I would expect a much wider deployment over the years of these models. So that's why 
I guess we are discussing kind of the societal impacts of these models. Yep, I think that's it for my portion, and I'll hand it over to Leslie. Thank you, Najong. That was excellent. That was fascinating. Um, and I'm, I think we have a lot to talk about in the, in the open question session. Uh, next, uh, I want to uh, turn the panel over to Professor Wildman. G'day. As we say where I come from, I'm going to be telling you some stories as a good humanities scholar. So um, I'm going to stick to a text, which will actually save time in the end. So a colleague shared that his middle school daughter's friends are using ChatGPT to draft writing assignments already. Members of Congress are using ChatGPT to write rational and informative speeches with logical argumentation, believe it or not. ChatGPT is passing exams in law, medicine, computer engineering. In a study of Stanford University students, dozens of survey respondents said they used ChatGPT on their writing assignments as soon as it was released in November of 2022. GPTs can also write witty toasts, biblical sermons, Comforting condolence cards. I gave ChatGPT one of my assignments for a class I'm teaching this semester, write an account of Martin Luther King Jr. as a public leader, and it produced a fair answer. I asked for more detail on MLK's specific leadership style, and the essay improved to the point that I would have given it a B grade had it been submitted by a student. It's not just school and work. The new generation of large language models will greatly strengthen the investment in digital immortality technology made by Microsoft and other corporations such as Hereafter and Deep Brain AI. Younger generations will quickly become accustomed to speaking with dead grandma as if she were alive and present. They will have deep friendships with AI companions. They'll get advice and even therapy from wise AIs that are trained on responding to the struggles of the human condition and the drama of human relationships. And they will participate in these relationships not only verbally but also visually as their AI companions take a variety of physical or virtual forms and communicate in more human-like ways. It is abundantly clear that there is no going back. Even a civilizational collapse would not cause us to forget how to build large language models and accompanying visual processing methods. The question for everyone, including educators like me, like us, is how to move forward. There are profound ethical issues embedded in these technologies. To begin with, though Elon Musk helped found OpenAI as a non-profit venture committed to open source products, he walked away when it transformed into a hybrid for-profit enterprise and surrendered its open source ideals. But is it in the public interest for a company that produces AI image and text generation, among other things, to adopt a strict open source policy? Making GPT safe for public use requires content moderation. Just try asking GPT how to manipulate people's political or religious beliefs, as I did the other day, to see content moderation in action. It won't produce racist or sexist or violent or otherwise offensive text. For a while, you could jailbreak ChatGPT by asking it to stay in character. And there's a crew of happy hackers finding new workarounds for every intervention that OpenAI makes on content moderation. GPT-3 already manifested the problem of generating offensive content, so it was understood in advance that content moderation was critical for chat GPT. But open AI isn't the only game in town. An ethical nightmare seems unavoidable. Our future will hold GPTs that will be deeply offensive, trained on the darkest corners of the web with no content moderation. The way OpenAI handled content moderation was in part to outsource the tedious and often deeply disturbing tagging task. 
This is when workers attach tags to thousands of samples of offensive content so that GPT can be trained to adhere to a content moderation policy referring to those tags. The company winning that contract was San Francisco-based Sama, which positions itself as an ethical AI company with a purpose-driven business model that has lifted tens of thousands of people out of poverty in Africa and South Asia. The wages are low by US standards, less than $2 per hour take-home pay, according to Time Magazine's expose. But Sama argues that these wages are appropriate to the regions where their workers live and boasts about their excellent benefits packages. Outsourcing is always morally complicated, particularly given that content tagging is well known to be a psychologically dangerous way to spend your time. But without human involvement in content moderation, the automation of information provision is profoundly problematic, ethically and legally. When it comes to education, we must confront the issue of cheating. The ethics of cheating may seem relatively clear cut, but GPTs complicate the very idea of cheating because they can be used in so many ways. For example, we would normally encourage students to converse with friends to generate and refine ideas for a writing assignment, thinking this helps them verbalize and learn in a different mode. So can it be cheating to have the same kind of conversation with a chatbot? We would normally encourage comprehensive research to uncover hidden angles on an assignment. Can it be cheating if a student uses ChatGPT to sift through mountains of material and produce condensed summaries, learning about perspectives that they may have missed? Detectors of text generated by AIs are already locked in a spiralling arms race with AI text generators. In the terms of one of these, GPT-0, AI-generated text is low in so-called perplexity, which is a measure of randomness or unpredictability. It is also low in so-called burstiness, which is a measure of variation in perplexity. GPT-0 and other detectors are working okay for now, but GPTs are improving quickly, including in producing text with higher perplexity. How do we deal with plagiarism cases that are necessarily probabilistic instead of definitive, as it was the case in the old days? And how long before AI text detectors are virtually useless? People have proposed oral exams to probe how well students understand their own essays. But my students laughed at that and pointed out that they could easily study their own submitted essay to prepare for an oral exam just as they would study any other text. So an entire educational industry is geared around the principle that we use writing to teach students how to think. Thus, we are unprepared for large language models that are capable of making effortful writing a thing of the past, at least for a vast range of everyday tasks. This is one way in which GPT is profoundly disruptive technology. How do we learn to think after GPT? To understand how we came to learn to think largely through writing in the first place, let's review the history of what cognitive scientists call extended cognition, the use of objects outside of our bodies to support and enhance human cognitive powers. Our species didn't always learn to think through writing. Alongside orality, we've had movement and music, social navigation, and sci uh, anthropologists studying societies without writing have taught us a lot about how we can learn to think without writing. Dances and stories function as embodied mnemonic devices that make sense of a physical environment. They remind us how to relate to the animals and plants around us, how to find our way across vast distances. They also function as orientations to life values, teaching how to think about what's important and how to behave toward one another. Initiation processes consolidate such knowledge and test the capacity for thinking. The invention of writing was a great leap forward in our species' capacity to use objects around us to extend our cognitive abilities. Wherever it arose, writing transformed cultures from orality into literacy, changing the way people store and recall information, at least for elites. Eventually, we created the printing press, first in China and Korea, and then in Europe where it really took off. 
Mass distribution of printed material gradually changed the way nearly everyone learned to think. Through effortful writing, we clarify our thought processes, formulate our ideas expressively, generate sound arguments, entertain one another and spark new ideas. From papyri to books to computers, as the objects extending our cognitive reach became more complex, our way of learning to think adapted, but it still involved thinking through writing, writing to think. This is how writing became a mainstay of education. The deep concern about large language models I think I detect among many educational professionals has everything to do with not knowing how to discharge our sacred duty to our students when writing is no longer at the centre of teaching and learning. I suspect AI text generation is as revolutionary as the printing press. We're not simply reverting to oral cultures because much of what we do will be mediated by intelligent machines. Rather, we will learn to think through those machines, querying them, controlling them, using our voices and our bodies. The skills that matter most will be fluency of speech, intelligent querying and artfulness in getting intelligent machines to do what we want them to do. Schooling adapted to the printing press, STEM education adapted to the abacus, the slide rule, the calculator, mathematical software running on computers. Teachers resisted for a while, but the new generation took the novelty in stride and developed new ways to think. I teach ethical and responsible computing here, and recently I led a case study on OpenAI's ChatGPT with four dozen juniors and seniors. The goal was to produce a policy we could use in our class. After making sure we had a solid understanding of the technology, we broke into groups, each of which generated a policy and shared it with the class. Thanks to hard-working teaching assistants, we soon had an entire wall of notes on the various policies to consider. Through open discussion, we located the consensus and formulated a draft policy, which we then fine-tuned over several classes until it achieved unanimous support. Students understand that AI text generation is here to stay and will improve quickly. They want to learn to use AI text generators wisely, building new capabilities without compromising their ability to think and write. They want to take account of the perspectives of their parents who pay for college, universities that authorise student skills with diplomas, employers who trust universities to train their future workers. A few students initially wanted to ban ChatGPT, but that was because they saw it as devastating for learning to think through the medium of writing. But they could also see that any attempt to ban it would be futile. Many were concerned about cheating in what is a competitive process of angling for employment in the tech industry in the context of this class. So we produced a policy that they liked. I could live with it. It imposed new demands on me as a teacher, requiring grading to check for GPT-generated text and to take account of an appendix to any writing assignment that documents precisely how and why they used AI text generation. I admired what the students achieved. I think they were proud of themselves too, but I came away wondering how they will adapt to a world in which text generation is handled by deep learning systems rather than by effortful thinking and writing. Microsoft's reported $10 billion investment in OpenAI and Google's release of its own AI text generator guarantee that large language models are going to overcome most existing limitations rapidly. The descendants of today's GPTs will be embedded in every computational tool we use, from office products to search engines, probably our cars and refrigerators too, given the way the Internet of Things is moving. How will a new generation of people learning to think deeply about the world respond? And what about their teachers? Educators must still teach students how to think, but writing can no longer be at the centre of our pedagogy. I suspect it will become even more of a specialised skill than it already is, like writing computer code is a specialised skill. My students are worried that their high-tech world will rob them of skills that they need and want. I was moved by that. But they're also excited to see what's coming. One thing is certain, most of them will adapt better than their parents, better than their professors, 
better than me. Now, some pedagogical lessons to wrap up. Even knowing something about the long history of extended cognition in our species, I still find myself deeply attached to the particular objects and processes that have helped me and my students learn to think through writing. Paper and pencil, blackboard and whiteboard, typewriter and word processor. While one part of me insists that effortful writing is essential for good thinking, another part demurs, recalling how creative our species has been at using a variety of objects that extend our cognitive powers. The most realistic and immediate deep threat of AI isn't conscious machines that outthink and enslave us, as in the Matrix. It is unconscious, super-intelligent machines that literally do what we tell them to do without understanding the background information we take for granted when we give instructions. Tell an AI algorithm to win a computer game and it will discover and exploit every possible thing it can. It'll find all the software bugs, It'll find all the techniques that humans can't use, completely unaware that what we really wanted was for the AI to play like we play. But the way humans play is something we don't know how to describe precisely. So it's very difficult to avoid giving an AI misleading or ambiguous instructions. The single most important skill we need to master, uh, to have a chance at a productive future with AI is to align AI goals with human goals. People with the ability to achieve that alignment will be extremely valuable in the future, but everyone will need it to some degree just to function with intelligent machines. This skill is a new kind of thinking, empathically connecting with machines, understanding what they can and cannot do, efficiently querying and, and instructing them in ways that avoid hidden assumptions and ambiguous instructions. Beholding the ease with which younger generations construct web queries by comparison with their parents is a powerful reminder that this kind of thinking does not arise naturally within our species. It is a kind of thinking that must be learned using different tools than we employ for thinking through writing. In the future nearly upon us, it won't hurt to know how to write beautifully and clearly, just as it doesn't hurt to know how to navigate by the stars how to start a fire without special tools, how to carve a canoe from a tree trunk, or how to recite one's ancestral stories for the young'uns. But other kinds of knowledge and other modes of thinking may come to matter more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wesley. That was really inspiring, and we have, a, I think, a lot to think about. Uh, at this point, at this point, uh, we can open the conversation, and we can uh, bring your questions into the conversation with our panelists. So um, I'm eager to have you, if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, and we'll bring a mic, and uh, we have a first question right here. Go ahead. Um, hello. Thank you so much for a um, informative conversation. Um, first question to the professor of linguistics. Um, if you could briefly explain how the information collection happens and what allows ChatGPT to learn in real time, as you said, and how does the supervision work? And what is, like, how could you define it very briefly? Um, I think there are multiple questions there. So the first Yeah, two question, questions. So, so first one is, like, how did the data collection happen for training the models? In real time, yeah, you said that. It, oh, in real time. Yeah. Oh, so, what I, so that was, like, in the, like, sort of the next step slides, right? So I think, like, in the screenshot that I shared, how that is being achieved is I think it's like hooked up to Bing Search. So Bing Search is like you know updated, not real time, but like it is like kind of you know asynchronous, but like pretty up to date. So that's how they get access to um, sort of real time ish updates, and that's one way of achieving it. Um, I would say. 
so that was one question. What was the second? What was the, the second, second one? Part? Was um, what does the supervision entail? Could you please define supervision briefly and explain to what end it is employed in chat? Yeah. So super, it's like supervised learning is a terminology in machine learning. So it means you tried like googling and it did not yield very good results. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it just basically means you have like a gold label that you can get signal from. So the second part of the pipeline that I described, um, you had. The input, which is the um, the query um, given to the model or the prompt, and then like a human annotator actually uh, came up with a demonstration that is an appropriate response to that query, right? So that is treated as some sort of a gold label for that response. So you have like an input output pair that you could get like supervision signal from. That's what I meant. Yeah. So it does not include a human being supervising the well, algorithm. Well, it's <laughs> somewhat indirectly so, right? Like it's not involved in the learning process, but the human uh, human learner is providing a signal of about what is like an appropriate response. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, if there is time, I would like to ask you a question too, but I don't want to hold this mic hostage. Uh, we have a question right here. Hi, um, this is a question for Professor Wildman. Um, <clears throat> throughout our lives, we often hear um, the question, you know, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Um, for a student like me, um, a freshman, um, I'm not really quite sure if I can answer that question. Um, any more given how disruptive technology like this is. Um, could you maybe provide insight on your thoughts on a question like that or where you see yourself in 10 years? <laughs> if I were answering this question in a conversation with you, I'd want to find out what you're doing here, what your plans are. And similarly, for me, you would want to do something, uh, I, th I think context and background matters. Uh, I'm a book publisher as well as a professor. So in the next 10 years, I expect that book publishing operation to become more intense in my life. Um, I'm deeply concerned about the future of books and the future of publishing in light, not just of ChatGPT, but of the publishing industry itself, which is very difficult to get into if you don't have the right kind of background. So how to respond to the reality of AI generated text, which in very short order will be producing novels and uh, non-fiction books at the length of a publishable length. Uh, do I really want to be publishing books like that? Do I, do I really want to be uh, uh, that committed to being open to the future? Or at some point do I just want to dig my heels in and say, hell no, I'm only publishing human works. Uh, I think I'm probably going to dig my heels in and I'm not going to live long enough for that to be a bad decision. But my children would probably experience that to be a bad decision. Thank you. Uh, I think the next question is uh, over here. Over there. Yep. And then we can go to you. Um, thank you to both of you. It was a really wonderful panel. Um, and I think uh, I'm in the law school, and I am looking for the faculty member who's sitting right in between you guys, because I, I absolutely understand the long-term, deep issues about education and learning that we need. And I am also curious about who's developing resources for transitioning this titanic ship of words, which we are, I mean, our students have avoided STEM, basically. And, um, you know, how to take all of this thinking and move, you know, the, out, the bodies outside of our school to whom we answer and, you know, who's developing the resources to help us as faculty members to figure out how to arrive at this, you know, at, the, at this other learning platform, because, yes. Can you actually, yeah, you actually hear that, yeah. 
couple of things. First of all, the Council of Deans and other people uh, high up in the central administration are worrying about and acting on this. So the aim is to produce resources for faculty. I, I'm not directly involved in those conversations, but I try to overhear them. I don't think they're going to leave us abandoned for much longer, but a lot of us are, have assigned midterm exams right now that involve take-home writing assignments. So it's a, it's a non-trivial question for us this week. You know, it's not like we can wait a year for people to sort this out. The second thing is this morning in the class on data society and ethics, we were talking about machine learning in connection with the uh, criminal justice system. We had a brainstorming session where the student's job in tables was to come up with problems, ethical problems inside the system, the criminal justice system that could be addressed potentially by machine learning. And one of the suggestions that came up was quite disruptive. It said uh, defence attorneys who are public defenders are so overworked that they very often can't give an adequate defence to their clients with all the goodwill and skill in the world. They just don't have time. It's a terrible problem. So machine learning defenders might turn out to be a lot better than public defenders. So in your situation, I'd be worried also about the future <laughs> of the legal profession. <laughs> It's the, it's yeah. the transitional resources, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, next question is over here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you both for the informative panel. And a question for Dr. Weilman with regards to the use of chat GPT within CDS. Uh, why choose to start the policy discussion with students rather than the faculty here? Because students are a captive audience, as you well know, being one of the students in that class and having... <laughs> <laughs> um, also, faculty are very slow and deliberate, almost ponderous, you might say, whereas <laughs> students are fearless. Moreover, faculty are attached to a series of habits that are ingrained, whereas students understand that their future is shaped by what's coming, not by what's happened in the past. So you're a much more promising audience to have this discussion with. Thank you for that question, yes. Uh, next question's over here. Um, in a hypothetical situation, say a student were capable of creating uh, his or her own, own on completely uh, on their own on, ch on chat GPT or a similar technology, would there be any ethical qualms um, with using a technology for an essay, for an assignment, if, uh, if it was only the student's work uh, to make the technology. That is an absolutely fascinating what if. I think part of the reason why OpenAI decided not to maintain its open source code policy was this sort of worry, that people could create a billion different um, a billion different GPTs of one kind or another, after which they could claim ownership, legal ownership of the output and uh, legitimately submit it for an essay or something like that. So, uh, that yeah, people are trying to avoid that. Uh, however, the ethical problem would depend on perspective a little bit. If you were a teacher who was interested in helping you learn how to write, then that wouldn't be an acceptable response. If you were a teacher, interested in learning how to, interested in helping you how to solve a problem, regardless of method, then it would be an acceptable procedure. To your point, actually, with uh, ChatGPT itself, if you look at the terms of service, from uh, they give you a legal ownership of the input and, in most cases, the output, too. How does that affect act the uh, same question? If, uh, if the you student is the legal owner in all senses of even the output, how does that affect the moral standing or ethical standing of using such a thing? I think my answer is the same. It depends on context. If the assignment is to produce writing of your own without machine assistance, then that would not be an effective solution or response to the prompt. If the challenge is to solve a problem, regardless of method, then it would be an acceptable approach. Next question is here, uh, Roscoe. Yeah, I actually, oh, 
Yeah, I actually probably had two questions, but they may be the same question, but let me flip them both out. One is that uh, text, at least in its sort of physical form and in the way we were talking about it earlier, is one dimensional, though with correlations over some distance. And so the sort of technical question is, does that matter? I mean, a lot of life is multidimensional and doesn't fit that model. The second question, which may also be the first question, is that part of the first question is that the model of education we're talking about so far in this discussion was thinking of it as fostering the development of individuals. But a lot of education also involves fostering things among groups and teams. Like in engineering, we do a lot of that quite consciously. And do you have a similar sort of vision or thought about what the impact on that kind of education would be? Maybe, Najun, you could take the first one and, and Wesley take the second. Mm -hmm. Does that matter for what? Yeah, definitely. The, one of the kind of the philosophical debates in kind of the LM community is like, do they actually like understand and like is if they're only trained on form, of course, like with the additional things on top of pure language models. Um, now the question is like even muddier, but like if you just think of pure language models, it's basically learning from form only, right? So you're not like, it's not grounded in any sense. You're, you kind of have like chunks of text that you try to predict the next token of, and like, could you learn meaning from that is um, one of the kind of ongoing debates in the field. And um, people have different thoughts about this, but I do think that like um, definitely like bringing in like some sort of grounding to these models could definitely make them stronger. Like for instance, or it can also affect like data efficiency of the learning process. For instance, maybe like if you do believe that you can learn meaning from form only, like learning from form only, maybe like um, bringing in some like grounding or like other modalities into the picture would either accelerate the learning process or like have some qualitative difference in the um, capacities that these models exhibit. So I would say like, you know, multimodal extension is like really important and like it would unlock like other capacities that the models currently don't have. Mm -hmm. Beautiful question about team learning. Uh, I my PhD is in philosophy of religion, and the sort of research that that involves is <laughs> sitting by yourself in a hole in a bathtub at a desk. Something it's very solo. It's you and the books and the great history of debates and trying to master them and produce a contribution to knowledge that way. Uh, but I also do the scientific study of religion, and, and in that way, we're using these gigantic teams on multi-million dollar grants trying to understand things about complex social systems. So that transition from individual solo learning to corporate group level learning was transformative for me as an intellectual. It was incredibly important. So I think even humanities scholars need to be learning how to do teamwork type research. It's, they need to be able to be solo as well, but they also need to learn how to work on teams. That's a general comment on what you said about the university. The thing is the teams now include AIs. They include people who contribute to knowledge. So the teamwork concept can, I think, include AIs in the way we learn, in the way we teach, um, even in the way we give introductions to panels. <laughs> right? So I think we can extend the idea of teamwork all the way to include AIs. Let me see if there's questions over here. Question here? Thank you. Um, recently, Vanderbilt University had sent out a, a notice of condolences about the Mis Michigan State University shooting. And um, it was sent out, I believe, from their Diver Office of Equi Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. At the end, it said, paraphrased, using chat GPT. And it backfired. There was a, a huge student. Um, Revolta, I was wondering about like the issue of sincerity and the ethics involved with something like that. Well, that, that does go to sincerity. I mean, putting the citation down there, giving credit, that's definitely sincere. <laughs> but I would say, 
Uh, to quote Ale Adam Seligman, uh, one of the professors here, uh, sincerity is not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> That's extremely bad judgment in my mm -hmm. view. What we're after is a human to human moment. Mm -hmm. And people are uh, in our culture at the moment profoundly counting on that kind of connection. And for someone to invoke an AI to help do that, I think was just very a very poor decision. Mm -hmm. No, no shade on Vanderbilt, it's a wonderful university. Oh, thank you. Uh, question here. I think this, um, maybe we have, hi, we have time um, for one more after this, so okay. go ahead. Um, so for both of you professors, uh, I think one of the most important questions will be, what will matter most, productivity and efficiency or learning and creativity? Mm. So as a computer science student, and just as an individual who likes to learn and read, what do you think we can do right now? Because I think of the things we have learned during classes, and ChatGPT can do all of them, right? Like probably all I have learned during college will be obsolete, like in two years, like computer science speaking. Um, so how can we manage a balance between thinking creativ creatively and improving our cognitive skills, but at the same time not becoming obsolete? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think like you need to really kind of think about like what the purpose of applying or using these models are. So I think like I'm all for like productivity if it's to like automate some like mundane things. So, so you have to write like a code snippet that like man manipulates like an extremely complicated pandas data frame or something like that. I think like you can definitely use chat GPT to solve these problems and like kind of accelerate your workflow. But I think like the more like fundamental like ways of thinking or like system design or like kind of like thinking about like designing a model or like writing a research paper, these things I think I mean, with the current technology, I think like there are, you can spot the flaws, but then like in order to get to the place where you can spot the flaws, you have to have some kind of base knowledge. And a lot of this like does come from like what you already know. So I think like kind of building up those skills is something you can pick up by like doing research or like participating in class and learning about these like fundamentals. So I think like Maybe the technologies themselves will be obsolete, but like the sort of the abstract motivation or like the learning curriculum behind it will help you, um, help you and like you know, kind of use this to your benefit to the maximum. And also, kind of you know, for using these tools, you need to be able to like verify the factuality of what these models produce. So like if you don't have that to begin with, you can't do that. So, and then these models are like you know. They can't be. Um, they can't be accountable for themselves for their outputs. Like if you publish a research paper using like these tools to help you, and they make a factual mistake, like you will be in charge of those mistakes. So I think like you know learning um, things that are taught in the university curriculum, which will also adapt to this kind of um, change, will ultimately like in the abstract help you like use these tools more like productively. And there are like there will be like ways to do that, um, and hopefully you'll be able to figure out like what is the best of application for these models. Okay, I think we actually have time for a, a few more questions. So I know you've had your hand up. Go ahead, right here. Uh, one of the things I'm most concerned about in general about machine learning is um, the uh, loss of job opportunity. So in 2017, uh, McKinsey Global Institute uh, wrote this paper called. A future that works, and they sampled 820 jobs around the world and um, measured the um, activities in those jobs that are automatable. And they found that one in four were already 70% um, automatable, and uh, one in five were 80%, almost 80%. Um, and that's before ChatGPT. And so I'm wondering, with the advent of large language models and uh, generative AI, um, we're having these conversations here, um, but a lot of people around the world don't have opportunities to uh, gain new skill sets. They're either in uh, some rural area and they can't um, move to places like Boston or New York, wherever. Um, maybe they're disabled. So I'm wondering, uh, like with these conversations I'm hearing right now about uh, you know, education, we have the luxury of like, you know, uh, changing our skill sets because we're at BU. But what about people who are in that um, one four? 
That's a beautiful question. Can I say I really appreciate the compassion expressed in that question because there's an awful lot of suffering that economic change can cause. Often it's disruptive and transformative suffering in the sense that it's extremely inconvenient but it is possible to find another way forward for a family or for a person. Uh, sometimes it just creates a dead end for people. So, so it can be really difficult. But I think an appropriate analogy here is the Industrial Revolution, which is a massive mechanization of a whole bunch of things that humans used to do, including new products that never used to be around that were automated as well. So the, we got used to that. The disruption, though, if you actually go back into the history, the, distru the disruption was horrific in terms of the way it affected people, their health, their well-being, their ability to take care of their families, everything. Um, no one's too sure exactly what GPTs are going to do to the economy. Um, we're paying attention to it because it's messing with education and we've dodged, we've dodged most of the problems uh, uh, in the educational industry, but it, we're not dodging this one. This is going to cause all sorts of problems in all sorts of ways. So I don't know the answer to the question. I think we're talking about something, though, on the scale approaching the Industrial Revolution. Uh, lots of people have imagined lifestyles that involve m mostly mechanised things taking care of human beings and human beings taking care of the mechanised things. I don't know if you want to live like that or not, but these people are presenting it. You know, you get a 20-hour work week and it's basically technical maintenance of machines. So I don't know. Super good question. Thank you. Uh, right behind you, right there, yes, thanks. I have two uh, very different questions. The first is you, you had mentioned that midterms are coming. Um, and I, uh, just to follow up on uh, one of the previous questions, wanted to ask whether you had any practical suggestions for professors giving out writing assignments and how we might actually uh, think critically about how to do this better in uh, an era where uh, we can imagine most students are going to at least run a first draft through ChatGPT. And a second, totally different question is based on the interaction that uh, Kevin Roos and other uh, uh, folks who've been playing with Bing's version of ChatGPT, known as Sydney, uh, which turns out to be a kind of obsessive, uh, love crazed uh, chat bot. How concerned should we be uh, about what? Uh, could become of this technology in terms of it uh, moving past just having the ability to chat and doing the kinds of things that it suggested that it could possibly in its darkest fantasies do, like issue malware and hack computers and ultimately even steal nuclear codes. How, how soon is that uh, a practical possibility? So maybe, Wesley, you could take the first question. Now, Jung, uh, maybe with reference to the tool use part of your talk, you could take the second question. I was, I was going to suggest the same thing. Well done, <laughs> Just to, so on the first question, the policy for which, the, to which that will point you uh, gives you at least one way to think about how to do this. Uh, I do think it's useful to use GPT-0 uh, you won't be able to use it for much longer probably, but it's still working pretty well now. To give you a probabilistic tip-off as to whether someone has cheated, stolen words. So uh, that, that's a good, good tip. But then talking to your students about what they want out of their education. Uh, do they really want to learn how to think? Do they want to learn how to write? Uh, the, the, this can help as well. You can't, in a probabilistic situation like this, you can't know for sure whether someone's uh, exploited a tool uh, inappropriately given the instructions on the essay. However, that's on them. If you've had the conversation as clearly as you can about what they care about, what their values are, then they're grown-ups, they're adults. They can figure out how they're going to act after that. So those two kinds of suggestions I'd make. However, I'm really looking forward to seeing the answer to the second question. <laughs> I'm not sure if I actually have an answer to the question, but I have like two kind of observations. So one is, 
As for the actual physical dangers of like things like, you know, malicious system like break ins or like actually like giving these models access to like well, like um sensitive information or like them being able to like hack systems, I think there should be some like safeguards in like what kind of like access like privileges that these models have at a company level or like at a system management level if you are going to actually incorporate these into like managing some sensitive systems or things like that. So I think there should be some discussion internally before actually like giving access, um, giving these models access to like these kind of like privileges. So that's one thing. But the second part is that, I mean, even without giving them these like explicit privileges, like there is like always a possibility of like psycho manipulation, right? Like it's not because these models are like like sentient or like whatever, like all of the debate. Uh, but then I think like us as humans are very like prone to assigning like intent and like, you know, we we really like to anthropomorphize like our communication partners. So even if the model is actually not like, like, you know, like don't have something like malicious intent, like we can still be like manipulated by it. So. I don't have. I don't know if there is a solution to that. Maybe like some other technologies will develop, be developed to like train these models to like not go down that route, or like better kind of align them to like um, sort of positive behavior and things like that. But I, that's to be seen, and that's like a real danger. I think. Um, yeah. So I don't. I mean, if I had a solution. Uh, that would be really great, but like I actually don't have a solution to that Thank problem. You. That's really encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question over here. This question can be for either of you, but you talked a lot about um, how ChatGPT in the future can be used in things like healthcare and cars and you know in our homes. And obviously, as cool as that sounds, that comes with a lot of risk and implications. So I was wondering if either of you could talk about some of the risks that are being talked about right now and you know what ways that those are going to be you know com combated or what policies are you know out there to take initiative on that. Do you want to talk about alignment? I don't know. No, Jung? I mean, I mean like I think like I can repeat some of the things the answers that I gave earlier like um there is a real danger if these models actually had access to like you know like important like safety related information or like systems that actually like have real world impact then that would be a problem because like we don't have unless we have like you know real control over like what these models like what the decisions that these models make so i think there should be like some barriers um built in before we actually like let these models actually like execute things on your system or things like that, and um, yeah, and then like the psychological harm of these models could be also a um, problem if you like decide to like you know have this model um, as your chatbot in your in your apartment or something like that. Then, like, if it it shows like Sydney like behavior that was mentioned, then like really that has the potential to cause sort of a, um, harm. Like, even if it only affects like zero point one percent of the population, that is like a lot of people. So, um, yeah, I think like you know just kind of deploying the system in various like applications has a potential for harm if it is not like controlled in some way i think like there should be some kind of like safety measures that is like somewhat already built into chat gpt right like so maybe like a um, application specific version of those kind of um, controls might be helpful in having better control over these systems but i think like it's also an open problem thanks i think we have time for just one more question um right here Um, my question is to both of you, whoever wants to answer it. Um, what do you think the probability is of AI reaching the level of artificial general intelligence? And potentially, obviously it's tough to say, do you think that can come within the next few decades or beyond? Can I 
can I just be honest? Like, I don't really care that much, um, so I don't really know. Um, but I think, like, what is real is that, like, even if it doesn't reach the potential of, like, artificial general intelligence, it actually has real-world impact, right? I think, like, that's more important than, like, trying to speculate, like, when it will become, like, a general, like, intelligent agent. And, yeah, I don't have good predictions about um, when that will come true or, like, whether that will come true or, like, in what form that will manifest. Can I just add that uh, the competence of superintelligent machines is really what matters. I completely agree with that. And it's coming, but it's going to be a while. We really need it to be a while because we need time to prepare. Like, we need to be thinking about how to get alignment correct, how to communicate with intelligent machines precisely so that they don't wind up doing what they want or th while I think they're doing what we want. That's a skill we need to learn. It's discussions we need to have, and it reaches all the way from young people learning how to communicate with AIs uh, in a way to get them to do what you want to policy levels where you, you actually regulate the areas of AI where that seems to be very difficult to achieve. And you can't take risks in that area if you don't know how to get a superintelligent machine to do what you want it to. Um, we're not ready for that, that conversation. We're way behind it. Fortunately, there are some groups who are really trying to have that conversation seriously. It goes way beyond the normal problems that we're used to with machine learning ethics, the, the problem with algorithms that, that participate in the human, uh, in human bias and seem to replicate problems that we have as human beings. Way, way beyond that. This has to do with the alignment of our intent with machine intent to avoid disaster. We need time to prepare for that. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, uh, we're going to wrap up. Um, I want to thank the panelists. This has been a, a really wide ranging and deep discussion today. And uh, I, f I have personally a sense that this is the beginning of a lot of conversation. We'll even remember today, I'll remember today, as the beginning of what's going to be, I think, a very long lasting conversation. So I want to thank Professor Wildman and Professor Kim. And I want to mention that uh, the conversation will, in fact, continue, that uh, Wesley has agreed uh, bravely, I might add, to um, answer questions on Reddit uh, in one of their famous Ask Me Anything uh, conversations, and that's going to come uh, take place on Monday. So you can follow that link to join that conversation. And with that, I want to say thank you very much to the audience. <laughs>